that is the unfortunately been the case for far too long and uh, thanks to uh, no thanks to to my to my country of origin in the states where we've promoted you know quite a oh, uh, quite an unhealthy uh, corporate way of eating <laughs> that's created more disease than the than the world has ever seen it seems oh the, the politics of it are fascinating when you go into it yes it, As you it's it is it's maddeningly it maddening it is maddening and fascinating at the same time. I actually have some politicians in my family, and uh, it's some you know the saying you can't see the forest because of the trees, and yes. that's oftentimes the case. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, the, I can see exactly how we screwed it up forty years ago. Well, why don't you give us your perspective? This is a great way to to uh, to to start because, uh, from your perspective, what how did we create this perfect storm of of chronic disease? I think it's quite simple. We actually fell into that pathway out of convenience. So, in the nineteen fifties and sixties, our food industry started addressing the way we we eat. And they started saying, okay, how can we make a better product for people? And we worked out that we could actually add sugar to food, which increased its uh, shelf life. And we could take fiber out of food, which increased its shelf life again, took mold, you know, mold stopped being a, a problem. And then we could add polyunsaturated oils to the food chain, which actually was cheaper in production. So everyone was a winner because it, you had product which you could actually put in your pantry and it would stay nice and fresh and tasted good and was cheap. So as a community, we loved cheap food that tasted good and the food industry supplied it to us and it was a win-win for everyone. But unfortunately, that was a slow trickle effect upon our health. And when we look back on it now, it's a bit like the tobacco industry. You can start smoking and it's not a problem at the beginning, sure. but a slow trickle effect over time um, creates what we've now got, which is a, a society which is you know, fatter and sicker than it's ever been. And it's only now in retrospect we start looking back at the science of it and you combine everything together and that combination, which I think is, you know, it's not just sugar and it's not just carbohydrate and it's not just polyunsaturated oils. My model of modern disease is actually a combination of all three. So it's, it's the amount of sugar, refined carbohydrate and polyunsaturated oil that we have and the frequency of it that's right. actually created a perfect model. Fascinating. Now, I had a look at your, at your website uh, that, um, and I think you actually have, uh, have pulled together this, you know, this uh, a model that, uh, can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, the thing about disease is we, we, we start thinking about diseases as individual entities, but in fact, at the root cause of every disease, particularly every modern disease, including diabetes, cancer, obesity, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, is inflammation. Right. So if you look at inflammation, that sets off a whole series of events and chaos in the body. Yes. So rather than looking at these as individual diseases, let's go back to the root cause. And the root cause, I think, is inflammation. Okay. And so what <clears throat> I've been involved in as a group is developing that model of modern disease. And if you look at the combination of sugar, which is, and it's the fructose component, and you combine it with the significant amounts of carbohydrate, the byproducts of that are what we call the small dense LDL, or the bad cholesterol particles. So everyone's heard about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Sure. We understand that the small dense, low density lipoproteins, that which are loosely called the bad cholesterols, they're the trouble which actually sit inside the blood vessels and cause a lot of disease. When you combine that with polyunsaturated oils, then you create inflammation. So what's really interesting is that the thing that produces those LDL particles is in fact fructose. So that's half of sugar. And we've only actually really worked out the metabolism of fructose in 2010. So we actually know a whole lot about glucose, which is the thing which most people have heard about, but that other half of sugar called fructose is actually the information and the science behind that's actually brand new, at least in a nutritional sense. So if you look at any papers before 2010 and arguably before 
2012. I think they're out of date. Wow, fan. that's fascinating. That's you're totally right. There is there is very little attention to um, you know outside of a few people, but uh, nutritionally, I I've had spent I probably looked at thousands of nutrition papers and studies, and I don't recall seeing anything on fructose. Well, it's there, but you need to go searching for it. Right, right. And, and so we've accepted that fructose is the thing which then, when it's metabolized in the body to the small, dense, low-density lipoproteins, the bad cholesterol particles, we know that that's the link with inflammation. What we've only come across in the last six months, really, is that refined carbohydrates, which is the breads, the rice, the pasta, and even potatoes, actually, they get metabolized normally only about 3% of them into fructose. But if you're overweight, so if you're obese or you're diabetic or insulin resistant, which some of your followers may hear of that term and you'll hear more sure. and more about it. Oh, yes. If you're actually insulin resistant, then you don't convert 3% of your glucose into fructose. You convert, convert 30%. No, wait, so, let, let me make sure I get that correctly because that's fascinating. So, so from what you're, you have seen, normally a normal metabolism would convert 3% of processed carbs into fructose. But someone correct. who maybe has some metabolic dysregulation or, meta, or problems might convert 30%. Is that right? Correct. And I think that is the runaway train that we've got in society now. And that's the model of modern disease. So what I've been involved in is describing this model of inflammation, which I think sits behind everything. So if you actually, and as a society, we're now chronically inflamed. You start looking at blood tests on people and patients with or people with metabolic syndrome, yes. they're actually low-grade inflammation. So rather than think what is the cause, you know, what is the cause of that inflammation is really if you can find that cause then you have the potential to reverse inflammation. Yes. So we hear lots of people take anti-inflammatories. We hear lots of people take antioxidants. We hear lots, you know, there's lots, so much marketed about antioxidants, whether or not it's green tea or goji berries or the latest um, superfood. Yes. They're all treating the problem after the event. Right. So we're giving antioxidants or we're treating disease after the event. My take on it is let's forget treating the disease. Let's stop being reactive. Let's start being proactive. So and proactive. Could we, say, to, could we say our present approach is sort of like um, <clears throat> if we have a, let's say here in, in uh, or like Southern California or in Southern Spain, there's lots of forest fires. And instead of trying to prevent the forest fires, if we just spent more money pouring water... <laughs> on the forest fires but didn't do any prevention. Maybe that's uh, an analogy. What you're saying is we should do more prevention, prevent the inflammation in the first place by treating the root cause? Well, just like your bushfires, if, if once you've got it out of control, you're never going to get it in control. And health and obesity and diabetes, which is dear to my heart, are totally out of control. And so when you look at those problems, we actually have... We're not winning, and the health budgets of every country, you know, whether or not it's the United States or Australia, I do some work, work in the third world, in the, um, the South Pacific, in developing nations, they, they, they're going broke based right. on our health situation. Sure. And so the model we've got at the moment of trying to treat disease and being reactive about it <clears throat> isn't working. It's financially going to fail. Forget the personal cost. Financially, it's just going to ruin government after government. So the only way I see to treat it is to go back to the root cause. Yeah, it's... it's and that's, and that's, uh, that's the that, food it's, chain. Well, that's, it's such a common sense approach. It's, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I guess humans from... Uh, humans tend to be resistant to change. And so sometimes we need to... We need a crisis in order to uh, to see the reality. So you know, hats off to you for for being one of the people on the forefront of this. Because, uh, gosh, you're you're totally on. You're totally correct. It's so needed. Here in Spain, they're now dipping into just. It just came out uh, a few days ago that the government has, uh, which is greatly in debt, uh, 
do for, for various reasons, uh, has been uh, dipping into the Social Security Fund, which was supposedly off limits. And they've now uh, apparently uh, spent a large proportion of that financial reserve just to keep things afloat. Um, and, uh, so, and it fits right at the same time, of course, here, health care costs uh, are rising. We're seeing a, um, a noticeable increase in obesity and diabetes uh, in the, just since I've been here since 1998. I can look out my window and, uh, and just look at the people on the street, which is very unscientific, but it's quite evident, especially which, what really, um, is even sadder is the, is the you know, the, with young people. And do you, I guess you see that uh, as well. Do you see more childhood obesity, childhood, um, do you see, you know, type 2 diabetes with children? Well, children's obesity is rapidly on the increase. In fact, China is the highest rate of increasing obesity in children in the world. And hand in hand with that is an increasing rate of diabetes. Sure. And guaranteed that will be diabetes-related conditions within the next 20 years for those children now. It, it is, it's just spiralling. And if you're, if, as you say, you've just got to look down the street to see that it's an increasing problem. Sure. And, it, and for my work, it's not just in Western nations. It's happening in developing nations as well. And none of us can afford to do it, let alone developing nations. Right, right. And it, which, and it doesn't even touch on the, the, you know, there's so much, so many people, once they're affected by, you know, this pre very preventable disease or, uh, you know, how much of their own potential as humans is actually uh, impacted by, uh, you know, um, so, so let's change gears a little bit and talk, <clears throat> you know, talk about some of, uh, some of the, uh, some of the solutions as far as, pub if we could, could we talk a little bit about public health policy? and suggestions for, for, you know, for politicians that might hear this. I'll have some family members. And where would one start? And I know there's so many heads to this monster, you know, this multi-headed dragon that is, cre is creating all these problems. But where would, uh, from your experience, what would you suggest, you know, if, if you were being consulted by the heads of, heads of uh, government, um, where would one start? What would be some of the action steps? I think that the major issue here is exactly what we're doing at the moment, is that this is not being a top-down approach to healthcare. This is a bottom-up approach, and I think the people are now leading this. Traditionally in medicine, if you come up with an invention or an idea in medicine and it's researched and then proven, you then have to... It takes about 10 to 15 years to get that into the common medical industry. Yes. The common, and, th and then it becomes accepted by the medical profession it then takes another five years to enter into guidelines and for government to accept it. And then it takes another 10 to 15 years for that to be become accepted in the public. But look at smoking and tobacco and the regulations associated with it. It took a long time for it to become government regulations, whereas uh, we knew about smoking having problems for society for 20 years beforehand. Sure. The difference which is happening with nutrition now <clears throat> and social media and the internet, is that you and I are having this conversation. The individual is actually getting on the net and finding out the information that, from, <clears throat> from my aspect, it's about eating low-carb, healthy, fat, nutrition, eating real food, yes. and they're hearing that. They are now going back to their doctors and questioning them about it. And the doctors are the ones that are now having to react to the patient's questions rather than Traditionally, the doctor's telling the patients what the latest and greatest is. So I'm, I'm, I'm running my, you know, my, you know, my program here on multiple levels. I do contact the politicians. I write to them. They, they say they're stuck by guidelines, and we keep trying to um, speak to them about that. And I've spoken to a few national bodies about that, and I present at their national meetings. But it's a long, long time coming for them to actually change. Yes. And there are major institutions. We've got our Dietitians Association in Australia, the Heart Foundation, whether or not it's the United States or Australia, still barking up this tree that, you know, go low fat and, right. and you know, don't, don't worry about sugar. And that's not working. Yes, obviously <clears throat> not. 
Um, the Canadian Heart Foundation recently backed away from their heart tick, which is good. And <clears throat> just losing my voice here for a sec. <clears throat> Can you edit this bit for a sec? Sure. Oh, yeah. Hang on. I'm just going to get a glass of water. Yeah, Hold on. No, no rush okay. here. No rush here. This is fascinating. Yeah, back again. Sure, fantastic. <clears throat> uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> oh, no worries. For someone as healthy as me to have them go off and have a cough isn't a good sign, is it? <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So we were. T so you were talking about. We were talking about the, you know, changes that <clears throat> one could. The way this is going to be. Uh, this type of change is, is going to be. A bottom-up change and not a top-down mandate from um, from the from the official, you know, uh, official government sources or associations. I don't think we can wait twenty to thirty years. And if you if we wait for bureaucracies to change, it won't happen. Yes, it certainly won't happen in the next five or ten years. Um, I can talk about corporate vested interests in the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry. And there's lots of lobbying that occurs before changes occur. We had our Australian Dietary Guidelines come down in 2013, and in that it said there should be a reduction of sugar. Within hours of that document coming out, the food industry was saying that this is, you know, nonsense and it, you know it needs to be modified down and can't possibly be correct. So there was a lot of spin doctoring. Oh yes, right word go. Um, the World Health Organization uh, came out with the, their uh, comment that we should reduce our sugar consumption down to about five teaspoons per day. Um, if you go back a couple of years, they tried to do that and they, there was allegations of them being persuaded to not bring that down because of uh, a lot of lobbying from the food industry. So I think government institutions and people who write those guidelines are prone to being, you know, uh, affected by vested interests. But the people who don't have vested interests at a corporate level are the people on the street and they're the ones who recognise that what we've been doing isn't working. And I'm fascinated, like you are, by you actually putting yourself out there in social media, you get exposed to a lot more information. Oh, yes. And, and people are aware that, you know, getting... It's just not working, what we've been advised by, the, you know, by our, our governments. And looking for alternate sources, and those alternate sources of information are there on the internet. I accept that I'm just part of the noise that, that's out there, and I'm actually you know, creating more confusion because I'm saying, you know, let's start eating you know, low-carbohydrate meals and eating more healthy fats after people have been you know, fearing fat for the last 30 or 40 years. But... Ultimately, you know, I think this information will keep gaining, you know, strength. The literature is coming out in support of low carbohydrate, healthy fat eating. Every week, there's, a, you know, there's another article popping up in the literature, and, and there's virtually very... no, nothing coming out, you know, saying let's go back to the old ways. <laughs> that's that is true. That is true. Now, for um, I've also got some doctors in my family, but, you know, very conservative, traditional doctors who. Uh, who would uh, who would ask? I mean, well, you know, where can I find this literature? Because I don't have time to search for it. Um, and I have suggested to them, well, let's you could look at some of uh, Gary Taub's work. Uh, would you have some other suggestions for a concentrated p place to that I could direct, or you know, we could direct uh, doc, you know, busy MDs and other healthcare people who want to. You know, put themselves uh, in, you know, up to speed if we, you know, and uh, so that 
so that we could help them with that? Well, one of the things, I, when I speak to doctors and give lectures on it, I actually say to them, I'm not there to convince them that I'm right. I'm not there to convince them that low-carb, healthy fat eating is the way to go. My job is to create doubt in their minds that what they've been practicing for the last 30 to 40 years is in fact wrong. And that's, what I, that's how I started. I, I, I heard about this and I went, hang on, that doesn't make sense. Um, I practiced it myself. So I, I, the moment I started doing it, I lost eight kilograms very quickly. And I'm now 25 kilograms below my peak weight. Uh, but when you look into my past, I've had cancer in the past. And I think this is the way to treat you know, my health and my family's health. And so what you do in that whole situation as a doctor, if you've got an inquisitive mind and an open one, start thinking that maybe, maybe what you've been told for the last 30 years is in fact wrong. So I've read, you know, Gary Taubes has written a great book. Um, in Australia, we've got David Gillespie who's written a few books about this sweet poison and good oil, bad oil. Um, Steve Finney and Jeff Bolick have written The Art of Low Carbohydrate Living, and I think they're, but they're all good books to, to start. I encourage doctors to read them because they're not long reads and go and then try to prove them wrong. Ah, oh, that's, um, that's a great way to look at which it. Which is what I did. And, and I've, I've caught up with um, Steve Finney. I've caught up with uh, David Gillespie. I haven't caught up with Gary Taubes. We, but... You know, I, I tried to prove these guys wrong and all I did was find out, hang on, this is the way to go. I mean, and so for my aspect, I, I've got a, a, a starter sheet which I give to all my patients and people who are interested. And then people said, I need more information. So that's when I did the website and nofructose.com and that's, that's all there. It's free information for people. And there are references there if you want to keep chasing that. But all I start saying to people is, there is something in this. It works for me. It works for my family. It works for my patients. Uh, and I, and the more science that you look into, the more it keeps proving it. And for me, I, I needed to go back to the basic biochemistry. And sure. so the talks that I give are practical-based. So hang on, this is the biochemistry. This is the science. You can't make this stuff up. This is what happens to fructose. This is what happens to... Glucose. This is what happens to polyunsaturated oils. This is, and when you put them together, you create this thing called inflammation. End of topic. It's it's a no-brainer. Right. It's pretty black and white. Um, I've had um, I've had a fair amount of success with. Uh, I do a lot of presentations, and uh, I usually I oftentimes start by explaining how the uh, how in our bodies react to the different macronutrients. So just looking at, uh, okay, here's what happens with a simple carbohydrate. Here's the insulin curve. Here's what happens with, uh, with protein. Here's what happens with a healthy fat. And just looking at the difference, obviously the insulin curve of the carbohydrate, as you can imagine, you know, it's pretty much up and down. And then the, uh, the protein is in, in between. And, the, and then the fat, uh, the fat relation to the insulin curve obviously is much flatter. And, uh, and then trying to teach people to, to, look, to notice how they feel. You know, if I were to have a, uh, like most people uh, growing up, we, we were following the, uh, the American Heart Association recommendations and low-fat skim milk, uh, low-fat or skim milk with, uh, you know, some kind of cereal with added sugar, probably, although we didn't know it. <laughs> and so, of course, you had this, and I was wondering, why do I feel, why do I feel this, crashed. I'm doing all the right things. I was this healthy, athletic guy and noticed at uh, 18, 19 years old, I would feel this mid-morning sort of, uh, sort of crash. And, uh, and so I finally got checked and I was told I had hypoglycemia. And so, and they, and, and so I started looking this up and, and uh, I realized that, well, why don't I, if the carbohydrates producing the, uh, this up and down, what if I just stop eating so much carbohydrate? And immediately I felt better. And it was, this was in, uh, this was probably, this was in the 1980s. But uh, when I told uh, a doctor or nutritionist about this, they were like, oh, no, no, that's, you know, you got to be careful. Keep your fats lower. <laughs> now, I, and we well, still, we're still, we still there, right? <clears throat> you're a lot quicker than me. I only worked that out about five years ago. 
Well, it was just how, uh, how I could feel it. I'm a, I'm a very, I think it was because I'm a very, uh, probably, you know, underprivileged athletically, athletic guy, but I wanted to compete. And so I was looking for all the, uh, any edge I could get, you know, <laughs> to, uh, to play better, you know, football, basketball, whatever it might be. And, uh, and so uh, it was just sort of like I, I couldn't understand why what everyone was – I could really feel this. Uh, I was in tune with it. I also did some triathlons. And, you know, when you do a long-distance run and cy- do a triathlon, you're a few hours of exertion. You, def- you, you have to get some feel, or you should get some feel of your own, um, your own blood sugar, your own energy levels. Uh, but anyway, let's, let take, let's go back to your, to your program. No. Just to finish on that, or to come back to that, I mean, the body has this hybrid engine that can run on either glucose or it can run on ketones. Yes. And the glucose, I call it, that's the carbohydrate. I call it like kindling. To keep the fire going, you've got to keep throwing it on and on and on. The, your, your blood glu- your, you know, it's like the fire temperature. It goes up and down. You need lots of insulin to keep it there. Yes. Or the other thing you can put in is this, you can put on slow-burning logs, which just keep the temperature going very nicely, keep the blood glucose at just the right level. Yes. And that and doesn't require an insulin response. So that's, um, to me, that's, that's carbohydrates versus fat, and then in between is the protein. The other thing, which is a really pet topic of mine, is cancer, because I've had it myself in the past, um, and arguably still going you know, to have to think about it all the time, is that 90 more than 90% of cancers only run on glucose. And virtually all metastases, secondaries when they spread around the body, only run on glucose. So this is sort of the pathway I came into it, recognizing, well, if cancer only runs on glucose, why do we give it more glucose? Right. Great, so, great question. And so therefore, that we know that glucose-lowering drugs, like or well, blood tissue glucose-lowering drugs like metformin actually are beneficial. And I said, well, why give a drug? Why don't we just have less glucose in the first place? Yes. And the other thing that cancers love is insulin and another thing called insulin growth factor one. So every time you have a meal of carbohydrate, your body produces both insulin and insulin growth factor one. Right. So the other thing to do is to avoid the glucose and the carbohydrate and then all of a sudden your cancer doesn't get glucose spikes, it doesn't get insulin spikes, and it doesn't get IGF-1 spikes. So this ketogenic diets are in fact the old treatment of cancer. They're the old treatment of diabetes, the old treatment of epilepsy, and you're going to hear a lot more about those because why feed a cancer something when you can avoid giving it to it? It's not going to cure cancer, but I reckon we can slow it down. Sure, but yeah, it's it's just a (laughs) no-brainer. It's totally Absolutely. a no-brainer. It's a uh, yeah. We're that's uh, that's fascinating. There's the in fact there is a test um, one of the one of the medical tests for cancer pa- cancer patients, which you probably will know, and I, the name escapes me now. Where there's you do a, maybe it's a pet. There's a scan yeah. and one pet injects. Scan. I'm sorry, and that is it's called a pet scan. Pet scan. That's it. Positive they, emission. And how does but how does the, and they use glucose. Is it in, is it is there an injection of glucose as part of that yeah. procedure? Essentially, um, we've recognised that cancers light up when you put labelled glucose into the system, okay. because the, the as I said, cancers only can metabolise glucose. Right. Um, well, virtually all of them can only metabolise glucose, whereas other tissues can metabolise either glucose or ketone bodies for their energy. Right. So we, we know that those cancers love glucose, so that's why we've got this thing called a PET scan. So if you are unfortunate enough to have cancer and you've had a PET scan and it lights up, then the very first thing that I would do as an individual is I'd go onto a ketogenic diet. I would, in fact, drop my carbohydrate through the floor and not give that cancer any more glucose than I can you know, avoid by Gluco, I think called gluconeogenesis, where our body produces a little bit of background glucose in the liver. Yes. And I'd give it no more insulin or IGF-1. And uh, so I, do, I recommend that to my patients. I recommend that 
that we actually do that. The moment, you know, if you get cancer, then bang, you're, you're off sugar. And can, and we'll, we'll hear a lot more about this in the next 10 years. We, we, we have to because it, it just makes sense. Yes. And it costs us. Yeah, this, now, the, now speaking of that, when, um, when you recommend that, uh, do you go into, for example, su- suggested meal plans or, or gen- what kind of recommendation? Of, how would you explain that to, to an average lay person? <clears throat> well, I think it's all about education. And so there are books to read on it, but um, in the last um, four months, we've opened up a centre here in Launceston in Tasmania where I've actually got dietitians that actually give this advice. So they can give that one-on-one advice. And that's been a, a huge asset to me to be able to refer people to it. Right. <clears throat> because we're all busy, I, and I'm still an orthopedic surgeon. You know, sure. You know, 50 hours a week. So this nutritional hat is one I'm wearing after hours. And so when I refer people, I'm not, I don't want to, uh, you know, it'd be nice to be able to treat everyone, but, I, you know, having the ability to refer people to a centre is, you know, the way to go. Right. And so we're doing that in Tasmania and we're, we're Skyping that like we are now. We can Skype that nationally and, and that's all starting to take off. Oh, that's because no. So the centre we've opened called the Diabetes and Health Research Centre is the first in Australia and possibly, you know, on, you know certainly Australia and New Zealand and all it is is offering this nutritional advice one-on-one. Oh, that's brilliant! And how many uh, how how many dietitians do you have there? We've got three now. Three, that's great. Well, that's and a great start. Well, it is after we've only been going four months. I mean, it's it, we're expanding, but it's about it's about just giving that advice, and it's you know, all we're doing. A lot of the time, it's actually demystifying this whole topic. It's you know debunking the myths of. We've been, you know, told to eat this certain way for the last, you know, thirty or forty years. Right. You know, I was just speaking about this um, <clears throat> yesterday with uh, there's a a, uh, a new friend of mine who's a he's a Hollywood fitness expert. Uh, he's been out there for twenty five years. He's also uh, also a, a cancer survivor, and um, and and so that and that sort of opened his eyes as well. His name is Vinny Tortorich, and. Yes, um, He's got a book called Fitness Confidential, which if you uh, – I'm not sure if you've heard of that one. There's so many books. Yeah, no, I, have you? I, I do know of it, yes. Yeah. I think I've, got a, a cop, I've got a copy of this. Oh, yeah. It's, and it's – I told him, you know, it's the uh, – um, well, as an aside, it's, it's the, only, <clears throat> um, the only health – really valuable health book that also is funny that I've run across in a while. But uh, he was having, you know, similar, a similar type thing and uh, – so this is uh, fascinating stuff. So let's let's uh, t- let's change gears a little bit here, uh, just to to drill down a bit on the on the carbohydrate. Uh, you know, when there is the and I noticed you used on the on the website the term lower carbohydrate, uh, which I think is is uh, maybe easier for people to to get mm. their head around. Um, and what would be the recommendation, or does it vary as far as the number of grams? If you have, you know, would you are you looking at twenty grams, thirty grams, less than hundred grams of carbohydrate, or how do you how do you go about that? I think you've got to you've got to start off with the, the, the standard American diet, the SAD diet, or the standard Australian diet is too high in carbohydrate. Sure. And whether or not that's at 200 grams, 250, 300, 400 grams, and it varies from individual to individual. And it does depend a little bit on whether or not you're insulin sensitive or insulin resistant. So if you're an insulin sensitive person, you can metabolize a little bit more carbohydrate. You know, that's the skinny person who's still able to stay skinny despite eating a lot of carbohydrate. Whereas if you're insulin resistant, you're more likely to put on fat if you're actually taking that carbohydrate in. So there's no right or wrong number for people. I think the thing, the idea here is to, in fact, reduce that carbohydrate down and depends on how far you want to reduce it as to what you want to go. If you truly want to go into a ketogenic zone, then you'll be reducing it down 
and it may be under 100 grams for one person, it may be under 50 grams, it might be under 20 grams of carbohydrate, and you, every individual will need to find that. I don't know, have you interviewed Mark Sisson? Mark's uh, not, daily yet. not yet, not yet. Hopefully, Mark, we, Mark, yeah, in the future. Mark's got a great curve called the Primal Blueprint Curve. Yes. And it's a graph which actually just sort of, it, it's just in nice terms, it says, you know, the more carbohydrate you have, the more fat you produce. When you reduce that carbohydrate, it's actually, you're, you get into a fat burning zone, you end up in a ketogenic zone. And the numbers are there, but they're not, you know, they're not accurate. And I think he states that, and I think we all do. It's actually a matter of reducing your carbohydrate. If you want to go to ketogenic, then you'll need to have some blood tests along the way or you know, finger prick tests that you can get like the diabetes meter. You can measure your ketone bodies. Yes. And so most of us, I think, who are lecturing on this topic are pretty, running, pretty well running in nutritional ketosis. Most of the guys I know and women who talk on this topic and certainly all of our dietitians and nutritionists who work in our unit are all running in nutritional ketosis. Um, we're not, but if it's not for everyone to do on day one. So if you're actually come along and you're trying to address your health, it's about reducing your carbohydrate, lowering it down, right. replacing it with natural healthy fats and leaving your protein about the right level. Over time, as you get more educated and you learn more about it, then people will start to actually reduce it even further. And I think everyone I know who's been doing it for more than a couple, you know, a year or two starts trying to move towards nutritional ketosis, which is a very natural way to be. Like that's what animals are for 10 months of the year. You know, it's not, and it's the way we were for two and a half million years. This right. is not a foreign concept to our bodies. This is a natural way of living that got us to the top of the food chain over, over two million years. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, two and a half million years of uh, humans existed, you know, with with uh, using that ketone engine. Is that yes, a, would, yeah. would that be fair to say? Yeah, for the vast majority of time. So we're, we're on this social experiment at the moment of the last fifty to hundred years at maximum of actually running on carbohydrate all year round, and it's not working. We've just got to look around. You know, disease is out of control. So. The glucose engine is not working. You know, it's a bit like I talk about kindling. <clears throat> you keep putting that kindling on the fire; it's going to, you know, burn your firebox out. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, you just you just um, triggered a memory that I have. <coughs> that uh, when I was when I was um, my degree is actually health science, and uh, and I took a, a number of a lot of some biochemistry, and actually I did the uh, uh, was was looking at medical school, and that. Um, uh, was my original plan, and then th some other things came about, and it wasn't a good time with uh, wasn't a good time at home to uh, to get to to do that financially. But uh, I remember the uh, the nutrition teacher used that example, but with carbohydrate, you know, explaining that okay, you should limit the sugar because that's like the kindling, but the complex carbohydrate, the healthy grains, that's the that's the log, that's the lo slow burning energy, and that's the way we were taught. And what we now know is, of course, that uh, even the, you know, and this is still what the, what the standard um, nutritional recommendation is, that complex, healthy carbohydrates are slow-burning energy. And uh, we now know that's not the case. Well, that, they're slower burning yes. than straight sugar, but they're not slow-burning. And so you know, the more glucose that's in a vegetable, and... <clears throat> You know, we've got to understand, I'm not, I'm not anti-vegetables, I'm not anti-fruit, I'm just saying we've got to reduce the amount. Sure. And reduce that glucose load. Yeah, that's... You know, so the, 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 the root vegetables, the one that's, ones that grow below the ground, <coughs> tend to have more carbohydrate in them than those that grow above the ground. You know, simple rule. Sure. Yeah, that's what we... The, the leafy... Yeah, the leafy greens are... Uh, <coughs> definitely a, a, the way to, to a way to go instead of uh you know coming up i grew up with a um, um a very uh irish influenced uh, food plan so we had a lot of meat and potatoes almost every mm. uh, every at least once a day there were meat and potatoes and uh so now we are uh so it took a took a while to uh, to get away 
get away from that, but I can't, uh, I can't tell you how much, how much I'm sure, well, I can, t- I'm sure you can relate, how much, uh, what, let's talk about some of the benefits along with the health benefit. What, what can, can you talk about uh, or have you noticed you know, mental benefits, cognitive benefits to okay. shifting mm-hmm. the ketones? I mean, it's been studied, but I mean, at a personal note, you, you, I, you know, I, I can go a lot longer and I think I've got cl- clarity of thought. And uh, I'm in surgery often for many hours and I think my concentration ability has improved. <clears throat> but forget my own story. I mean, there, it's well and truly associated with um, better cognitive ability and, uh, and certainly there's a role to play in, with um, Alzheimer's, you know, dementia. Sure. And, and epilepsy and, and Parkinson's. There is research being done in all those areas at the moment, which is trying to actually run people on in nutritional ketosis. And it will be, it's a growing field of, of literature. There, you'll, be, you'll hear more and more about that in the next several years. It has to. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating stuff. So as we, what we can see, it just occurred to me that this is, in the, it's almost like a, the, the, the idea of a, uh, of a wagon wheel, and in the core, we've got this nutritional component, and then we've got all these disease states that are affected by the, the high-glucose eating plan that we've that we're sort of uh, been on the last 50 to 100 years. So as we start to, uh, to get people into the, the lower glucose and the higher running on ketones, we're going to see a reduction in disease, but... We're going to provoke a res- obviously the vest the interest in the uh, and I have friends who work in in the pharmaceutical business. I was um, had uh, I, Merck and and Pfizer, Ciba, Gaig, a number of, of companies in the past that uh, had very cl- that still have close friends in some of these areas. They've all told me they are they are totally gearing up to diabetes as their biggest market in the future. They're just responding to what's coming at them, but. Um, hmm. At the same time, you know, that's, is there a way to, uh, to, I, it's hard to imagine a way to, to get the pharmaceutical industry to try to, uh, to do the right thing here and actually. Uh, again, I, I'm not going to wait for the pharmaceutical industry to, um, to come to my aid here. Right. I, I think di- diabetes is, a, is really badly named. It's called, you know, sugar diabetes. It's actually best called glucose intolerance disease or carbohydrate intolerance disease. So remember, carbs are just glucose. So if you, in fact, can't handle the amount of glucose load that you take in, then the other option is to reduce that amount. So at the moment, we've got a model of disease that says, have your carbohydrate, and the diabetes foundations right around the world are still recommending diets of 50 to 60% of carbohydrate have all that carbohydrate, and then take all your medicine to try and reduce your blood glucose. Yes. <clears throat> you know, if you've got a kid with nut, nut allergy, what do you do? You don't tell the kid to have nuts and then have an adrenaline pump or an adrenaline pen. You tell the kid to avoid nuts. Right. So the same thing with diabetes. We should be saying, look, avoid carbohydrate, and you'll need less medication. So every single diabetic patient that we have who reduces their carbohydrate load requires less medication and has better control. I mean, it's 100% guaranteed. I mean, it's just, again, we come come at this term no-brainer, but if you reduce your carbohydrate, you'll need less medication. Yeah, no question. Topic. No question. So I can't, you know, the drug industry are not interested in me talking about that because it means less sales. Exactly, exactly. And that's, um, that's, that's where as you, be- uh, I don't know if you've had, if you've had the, um, the pushback yet. Um, but as uh, just looking around at some of the people I know in the states that are some of the nationally known figures in um, that are that are pushing some of the alternative ideas. It's amazing. They're, they're actually real. You know, the science is, is so uh, is so clear. And it's such a basic uh, thing to understand, uh, yet there's so much, in- so much money and so much interest, uh, special interest groups on the other side. I mean, I remember, um, you know, with some of my friends in the pharmaceutical industry, they were, 
Um, I was, I happened to be in my, I was in Miami for a few years and they had a national convention and I was invited by some friends to go to, uh, to one of the dinners just because, uh, she, uh, a friend of mine, she needed someone to, to go, to go with her. And I said, sure. And it was, um, and I noticed all, they had most of the top s- sales reps, uh, from, uh, some of the, from one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies, just beautiful people as you as you, I, I imagine they do the same all over. It's great sales. You know, these beautiful, uh, special, beautiful young women and, uh, you know, nice-looking guys. And, uh, and you see this army of these beautiful sales reps going out every day to push the pharmaceuticals. And uh, she was telling me, listen, I've only got a couple of more years because they're going to move on. You know, as, as soon as I start to get old, they're going to get rid of me. <laughs> so I have to get <laughs> married soon. And she, th- she knew this was the, this was the cycle. So can you imagine if if we had thousands of uh, these you know a very uh, healthy young sales reps who were going out promoting low carb uh, healthy high fat eating? <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. Huh? Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's it's not there. But the money is the money that was there. I mean, I was offered a position, and um, and you know because i was doing a lot of a lot of public speaking and whatnot and uh, had a lot of contacts with these people and uh, and so i was offered a position to to go and they told me listen you know you're making i, I think i was making you know less than than $50,000 a year at the best and this was doing private fitness training on the side working 14 hour days and and they said listen you can make two to three times that and work a lot less and it was uh, you know it was tempting for a young guy who had you know, student loans to pay off. And mm-hmm. uh, so I think you're, I, I, it, it's a tough battle, but, uh, but, you know, hats off to you for, for doing what you're doing and, uh, and getting this message out there. Our, our national bodies, and I've just read a few statements from them, are talking about new drugs, new insulin pumps, new ways of monitoring, and the national bodies are not talking about reducing carbohydrate they're not talking about dietary control and and i, I find that you know I, i'll say it openly shameful that we're not talking about that because there is enough paperwork papers that are out there at the moment saying that the first and foremost management path of diabetes is tight dietary control and particularly that of carbohydrate there's a fabulous paper put out by richard Feynman only a few months ago which just summed it all up 12 reasons as to why Low carbohydrate eating is the first step in the management of diabetes. And it puts it down very succinctly. But we, you know, it's the internet and social media will allow the people to make the decisions, make the choices, and they will be the ones going to the doctors and saying, "Tell me about it." Yes, yes, no question. And well, we're going to definitely recommend, you know, try to send as many people as possible to toward your material and. Uh, because for um, and you may you probably have seen this as well for my you know doctor friends and family, my, oftentimes I joke with them that you guys won't listen to anybody who's not a who's not a doctor, and that's why I'm so happy right. to you know and, and I understand that they you know you want there's a certain level of respect among you know someone who's gone through the rigorous training and and uh, uh, that you guys have done. And that's why it's so it's so important to have people like you that, uh, you know, I'm going to tell uh, this uh, this weekend I have a call with my family and I'm going to tell all of them, listen, here's another yet another doctor, uh-huh. another MD who is who is doing this. It's not some crazy, you know, uh, California alternative uh, experimental lifestyle. This is this is the way humans have been living for most of our history on this planet. I, I, as I came back to it, I've gone down to the basic science of it. The basic science is there. And everything we're talking about just makes sense. Uh, and I keep joking, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. If an orthopedic surgeon can understand it, then, you know, any smart doctor can too. You know, we were always painted as the guys who don't understand too much. But the biochemistry of it completely and utterly stacks up that this is the only way to go. And, you know, and we know it is because this is becoming a viral topic. It's a very, very topical issue, you know, in nutritional circles. And in medicine, it will take, 
the longer the medical profession takes to react to it, the, the, I think I honestly think the more foolhardy they will they will look. So I, I implore doctors to start looking into it. Don't believe me. Then start looking into it because the more you look into it, the more you'll start saying, "Hang on, what we've been talking about for the last few decades isn't working, and actually doesn't make sense." And you know, we talk about this topic as a group, and you know, what we've been criticised for encouraging people to eat real food that's right. local and seasonal. You know, let's get rid of processed food, which has travelled a lot of miles, that's been sitting on the shelf, and just eat food that's local and seasonal. And what can be wrong with fresh food? Yes, in fact, uh, I think on the uh, on the one of your websites there, I, I don't remember which one, um, but I think it's the Diabetes Center. You have a graphic, uh, wonderful graphic there that that speaks to this point that you about food and and uh, local, fresh, you know, these very uh, important things. And um, it's such a uh, such a simple concept that we've been pulled away from, and it's almost like an Orwellian. Uh, uh, nightmare um, to uh, just thinking about the book 1984 or something. We've been yes. that we've been uh, sort of programmed to think that oh, just by the con- because it's convenient, then that I sh- should place convenience ahead of everything else. And uh, here in Spain, we're seeing an interesting thing. The you know the traditional uh, Spanish woman, or you know in most of the Mediterranean countries of Europe, most there there's still the, the Women 50 and above are no, mostly housewives. There weren't really many opportunities for education or for, for job opportunities outside of the home. So you still see the traditional roles. Then you have the, the younger people who are all, most of the females are more educated. In fact, last year there were more MDs, uh, female MDs that graduated than male MDs, and that's been a growing trend. But uh, anyway, the point is that the, the mothers still have the traditional cooking style, which is much healthier, you know, a lot of vegetables, just a lot of, uh, a lot of olive oil. And, um, and whereas the younger people are now, since unemployment is high, a lot of them are starting to learn to cook for the first time. And this is one of the things I, I've told my friends, at least there, here's the positive lining of the bad economy, in, um, is that at <laughs> least people are starting to value, you know, what they, what they didn't value, which is learning how to cook. Uh, do you guys do anything with with treat you know with uh, I guess your the dietitians might might speak to that with uh... I, that, that's a broader topic which we discuss is that maybe for the last twenty years we've lost home economics from the, the classroom we've stopped teaching our young women and and boys in the schools yes. how to cook and you know, even you know lots of even building infrastructure now you know major apartment blocks don't have kitchens in them. They only have a microwave and a washing, you know, dishwasher. So we, 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 even our buildings nowadays are, in fact, not designed to be for people to cook in. And wow. so, I mean, that, that's, that, you know, that's only, you know, small you know, places that are in cities, but that is actually a changing, you know, building environment. I think we are losing the ability to cook and, and all of that. And so in Australia, there's... Um, Stephanie Alexander has a education program which is really pushing food back into schools. So we've got people pushing these topics and we just need to get a bigger voice. And, but you're quite right. It's about getting back and eating your local produce, which is seasonal. Sure. And learning how, And guess what? You know, local food, which is seasonal, is actually cheap. Sure. Cheaper, much more <laughs> nutritious and... Uh... And it tastes a whole lot better, which is one of the things, Absolutely. you know, a lot of the, some of my, my less healthy friends will say, well, you know, I just don't like vegetables. And uh, because, and I would say, well, have you tried, you know, seasonal vegetables that are cooked just right, you know, with a good serving of, uh, of grass-fed butter or, uh, or olive oil on top? I mean, it's just delicious. Once you, of course, there's the, the element of the, the problem with the processed foods also is it's programmed to... Uh, as you know, to uh, to really stimulate the all the taste buds, and then you have the MSG, the excitotoxins, uh, and all these things that stimulate the dopamine, and so you get this hit from the uh, a lot of the processed food products, and so it does take. I notice it it takes, you know, from anywhere from uh, from five to 
to 20 days for someone to sort of recalibrate their own natural human sense of taste. Have you noticed anything or seen anything oh, on that? Absolutely. I mean, the most overpowering sensation is that of sweet. <clears throat> Our brains are completely addicted to look for it. But that's fine from an anthropological point of view. <clears throat> as hunter-gatherers or, or as animals, we know that if you find something sweet at the time of plenty, we can actually convert that into fat for winter hibernation. So we are, and it's a very overpowering sensation. And when you get rid of that sweet, constant load, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden food tastes better. Oh, yeah. And, and, and so, um, and remembering carbohydrate, I, I often talk about this, it is boring by itself. If you have a bowl of pasta by itself, oh, it's yeah. boring. Sure. Or a bowl of rice by itself, or, or even um, potato by itself is boring. So I'm the guy who comes along when you have pizza. I'm the guy who eats all the topping. Yes. You know, I have the meat, the vegetables, the colour, the flavour, all the texture. And if someone wants to eat that boring base, you know, they can have all that glucose and and I'll leave it on the plate. Right, all the filler, well, the cheap filler yeah, that, well, uh, that makes it so profitable. <laughs> well, what I do with, with the pizza base, I give it to the chickens. Oh, there you go. There you go. Good recycling. And then, I the egg then I have the eggs tomorrow. Good recycling. Well, Gary, that brings to mind a, a topic, and I know we're running up on time here, and, and uh, I don't want to keep you. I know you've had a long day, but uh, just to, for people that um, that might wonder, you know, what would be uh, what would be what would be some, a typical day, uh, like a typical recommendation for, uh, for example, what you might what one might eat for breakfast, what one might eat for for lunch, uh, just to give people a, a few a few ideas from your from your perspective. Oh look, I, I have often have I have an omelette for breakfast most mornings, which has generally got last night's meat and vegetables, you know, last night's leftovers. Throw them in with some cheese and you know a couple of eggs, and it doesn't take long. We've got you know it's, it's called a little sandwich maker. Yes. And I can make that in the length of time it takes me to make a cup of tea for my wife. Oh, that's so great. it doesn't take a lot of time. Right. Now that's the sandwich. Is that like mm. a, a sandwich maker that close that opens yeah. and closes? Yeah. yeah, and you do the yeah. omelette there. Yeah, so you can put a little silicon ring in, I throw the omelette into it, and oh. it's literally, I have my breakfast cooked in under five minutes. Yeah, that's, oh, that's brilliant. And, and so, I'll, or I'll have bacon and eggs, I'll have some cheese with it. Yes. I'll often have a bit of yogurt and a handful of nuts. And then I will maybe during the course of the day have lunch. And again, it might be a little bit of cheese, a bit of salad, might be a bit of tuna. Um, my my go-to snacks are cashew nuts and macadamia nuts, mm -hmm. and at night we'll have meat and veggies. That's right. it. And um, and you know if I if I'm after a bit of a treat, then I have double cream with you know a few berries in it. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's not every day. You know, sure. People often come to a house thinking they're going to starve, and and they don't. They come away going, "Hang on, that's uh, completely well and truly fed." Yes. Yeah, well, that's... our daughter, one of our daughters got married um, recently, and the whole reception was uh, low carb, healthy fat food, and everyone raved about the food. You know, they were surprised how good it was, and it was just great food which filled everyone up. Oh, that's uh, that's fantastic. That is. Uh... That's really fantastic to uh, that because that often is another issue as far as eat, when one is eating out and uh, but actually so when you're eating out uh, what would be something you you might suggest to people um, you know who are going to be eating lunch or or dinner out today? Well, I, I always question the chef as to see whether or not they're cooking in a polyunsaturated oil, but that's my part of educating the chef about what's happening in society. Yes, and. Saying, well, have you got anything that you cook in butter? So that's always a, you know, an opening point. But when you actually go through the menus, um, it's it's there. The, the, the meat and vegetables is on most platters. Um, I've got a lot of people, you know, who want to go out and have a hamburger, and what they, the restaurants, you know, around our town will actually will serve that hamburger without a bread roll. Yes. And they give you a bit of money off, so it's a bit cheaper. So again, it's about. Or you know, rather than use a bread roll, we often use um, some lettuce leaf. Right. So that becomes 
the, you know, that becomes the piece of bread rather than, you know, you just drop it on and that's the way you eat it. Right. So there are lots of options. It just means that when you go out, you don't go and have lots of bread and you don't have lots of rice and you don't have lots of, you know, desserts. Right. Yeah, but it's really not that... Serve it. It's really not that complicated once you get right down to it. I th- it's not you know, hard. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's part of the. I think sometimes uh, some of us, myself myself included, I think have sometimes overcomplicate our recommendations, and so I'm uh, learning to uh, to not talk so much about uh, macronutrient ratios and and micronutrient balance and blah 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 because most of for most people, that just is like a foreign language, and uh, and I think uh, that's why I think it's so important just to talk about, hey, here when you go out, here's what you can do, and have us, you know, a, a safe, uh, healthy, and uh, way to to navigate those situations. So that's uh, that's great information. The the other take home message with eating is, eat when you're hungry, and stop when you're full. Yeah. It, it's if if you're not hungry. Your body's actually, when you're in tune with it, you're not completely carbohydrate and sugar, sugar laden. You, your body will tell you when to eat. Right. And yeah, so no. you don't have to eat three meals a day or six meals a day. I mean, all of that's nonsense. It's just a matter. As hunter gatherers, we never had access to three meals a day. Sure. You ate when you had the opportunity, and you ate when you were hungry. So again, a lot of people struggle to lose weight because they're still having breakfast, lunch, dinner, morning tea, afternoon tea, little snack before they go to bed at night. You don't actually have to do it. Uh, that gets easier when the children leave home because my wife and I, will, well, we're not hungry at the moment. We'll have dinner later if we are. Sure. And we're not afraid to, we're not afraid to skip a meal. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, that is uh, very key. We've sort of been programmed to have to consume things at a certain time that uh, that may not really be necessary. I, I, re- I remember thinking back when I, when I skipped breakfast as a, as a young guy, I remember thinking, well, something is going to go wrong, but, you know, I didn't feel badly. I actually felt pretty good. I had a little more, of course, more appetite. I would have lunch sooner, but uh, I really felt good, and I, I remember it was usually on test days. I would, in university, I would... Be, be stressed and busy and uh, so I would skip breakfast to study and uh, and then I realized you know looking back I really felt fine you know I had more concentration <laughs> and uh, yeah. I retained more information and um, and it was uh, it was quite interesting so uh, that's uh, that, and I'm sorry go ahead yeah that, that drifts onto the topic of intermittent fasting which yes you may have heard of oh yes yeah so, I do do some of that myself now and, and so it's actually okay to go 16 or 18 hours between meals. And there are some um, some chemical reactions that occur there that may in fact have some protective mechanisms on our immune system by doing that. But again, that's not for people to do on day one. Sure, no, no more, uh, that's certainly more, a more of an advanced topic, but, uh, but a fascinating topic. Now, it's, you mentioned the... the, uh, the reaction, some of the uh, immune system reactions... Uh, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you what you've seen with with regards to that, with the the biochemical effects of intermittent f- or f- of fasting? It's 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 arguably tied up a little bit with our sleep cycles, our melatonin levels, and also our lymphocyte responses in the body. And the lymphocytes are often clearing cells that are involved in the immunity um, and settling down of inflammation, clearing away of cancer cells you know, as broad topics. So there, and again, it, it's early science on that, and I think we'll find, again, we're just reading some early papers about those effects of actually going longer with on periods of fasting. Oh, that's, that's fascinating stuff. So this might be something in the future we might see studies with, perhaps with a, with cancer patients, there might be, I mean, theoretically, some benefits if we're going to be stimulating the uh, the body's lymphatic system and lymphatic yeah, the, capabilities. The body's, yeah, the body's ability to, you know, to treat abnormal cells in the body. 
and that's what cancer is. Sure. I mean, cancer's been around forever, um, and there's archaeological uh, evidence of cancer being around for you know tens of thousands of years. So it's not as though we've got a new condition. What we do have with cancer, however, is we've got an increasing rate of a cancer in a younger population. Yes. So you know, breast cancer is now you know, you know, very common, but it's affecting women you know, as young in their 20s and 30s right. when it used to be a more, you know, a more advanced age issue. So we're seeing a change in the spectrum of cancer. Uh, and so you know, I believe there's a nutritional basis to it, and I think there's a nutritional basis to actually being involved in the treatment of it as well. So again, that and it all comes back to inflammation and immunity. Uh, I can, you know, and the, the the pathway of that is actually all related to uric acid and nitric oxide and its effect on uh, nitric oxidase. I mean, we're starting to get down some chemical pathways there. Yes, uh, but that's actually nitric oxide is a significant chemical in the body's ability to control. Uh, blood flow, and blood vaso, pressure. Vasodilation? It? It's a vasodilator, vasodilation. nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. And that's normally produced in the body. But uric acid, which is a byproduct of fructose metabolism, actually inhibits that pathway. So one of the ways that people have with... Um, with metabolic syndrome have hypertension is in fact it's related to an inhibition of nitric oxide under the influence of uric acid which is the byproduct of fructose metabolism. So we've always thought that gout was related and uric acid levels were related to our ingestion of meat and cheeses and That's, thought to be yes. whereas in fact it's just as related to our sugar consumption. So in the last 10 years in Australia, there's been a doubling of the rate of gout despite the community eating less meat than they've ever done. Right. So if you've eaten less meat and you're eating less dairy, how can, how can gout be increasing? And the long and short of it, our sugar and carbohydrate consumption has gone up in the same time frame. So uh, that, that, would, that fits. That would totally – because if you take – if you're eating less – of, of one thing, you have to be eating, most people are going to eat more of something else. I mean, it's... <laughs> but again, this pathway of fructose metabolism and the byproducts of that being uric acid, this is brand new science. It, it's new in the literature. And look, Tappy uh, in, uh, described all this in 2010. You know, it's quite a definitive article that he's written. Tappy, it's only been added Tappy. To look, Tappy, L-U-C, T-A-P-P-Y. The article is 2010 Physiological Journals. Uh, great article. And so we're only just learning about the, you know, all of this. And so to, to look back on papers 20 years ago that didn't understand fructose metabolism, it, it's, it, they're completely outdated. Right. Yeah, that's amazing stuff. So this, you know, this, it just occurs to me, one of the other areas of, that, I, that I'm interested in is, uh, is what some are calling, uh, uh, it's um, andropause, or, you know, male, some people are even turned the, the term, um, mano, instead of menopause, manopause, which has mm -hmm. certainly been promoted by the, uh, probably the, you know, certain interests that want to sell testosterone, testosterone creams and, and injections, etc. But uh, it seems like all of this, of course, this, this would also impact the, uh, you know, a, a normal healthy male as we enter our 40s and 50s. Uh, is there anything you could, uh, I know that's not really your specialty, but uh, any thoughts on that? I, I, I get contacted with people by people who want to talk about that topic. So I have looked into it. I'm not, as you say, I'm not a specialist about, you know, male hormones. Um, but one of the, the tumour I had was on my pituitary gland. So I've, had, I've developed it, it's 15 years ago. So I've developed a keen interest in endocrinology oh, in the like last, that. as a result of it. I mean, that's it's my vested interest in all of this. Yes. Um, I, I honestly believe that if you eat, eat properly, and you get back to eating real food and you reduce the inflammation in your body, then a lot of these hormone issues will iron themselves out. 
whether or not it's menopause or manopause. I mean, I, I, it's the, the women I know, including my wife, who has who are, are doing this uh, nutritional ketosis or you know low carb healthy fat lifestyle, are all looking fabulous. They feel fabulous. So they're, they're, their menopause symptoms have you know gone away or, or you know are, are a non-event. Again, it doesn't cure for everyone, but I know of numerous women who, you know, whether or not we're talking about adolescents with their period pain, yes. hormonal issues, right through to menopause, who have had a significant health benefit by dropping the sugar and the carbohydrates. And, um, and you know, we, that also embraces gluten sensitivities to a degree as well. Um, with... You know, men, males, and testosterone issues. Um, you know, I don't think we've got any research to talk about what happens with you know LCHF lifestyle and that those conditions. However, it makes sense that if you can get control of your eating and inflammation, then the hormone things are a secondary issue. Right. Well, you know, I I just do I do recall a um, something that I I had read about you know when a high that a high uh, high High fr- well, high sugar intake is correlated with there's an inverse relationship with some with with testosterone, and I don't remember the mechanism, uh, but um, it uh, it it may be because um, the of if if you're well high sugar, you're going to have high insulin, and you're going to be using up a lot of the raw materials that uh, the hormonal raw materials that uh, we have uh, to produce. <coughs> You know, to produce a hot, much higher level of of insulin, might that take away from the you know the raw materials the body has to produce other other hormones? I, I'm not familiar with the paper you're talking about, and I I, I think that you know I, I'm, I'm definitely going to be outside of my comfort zone talking about sure. That Let's, topic. We can leave that leave that for another time. Yeah. I know I'm sort of I'm sort of just geeking out on this and yeah, no. I, the, I, I mean, I've got. I, uh, I mean, I personally have w- concerns about testosterone supplements, right. as, as from an anabolic steroid point of view. I, I think that the, we shouldn't be adding too many hormones into our bodies if we can if we can help it, whether or not they are artificial or natural or chemically induced. Um, because I think we get enough in our food supply from you know. Uh, with stimulants with, with with the food chain, particularly with animals, um, sure. yeah. but uh, I mean, I, all I keep seeing is that I'm, I'm running a group at the moment of people, you know, which are trying to lose some weight, and they each have got health benefits, and they're all completely different. So I, I say to people, if you're going to try low carb, healthy fat eating, do it for eight weeks. And at the end of eight weeks, you make your own mind up. And that, that, that's and the thing is, you know, don't do it for a week, don't do it for two weeks. You know, stick with it for eight weeks and make it make your own decisions. And invariably, people at the end of that eight weeks adopt a lower carbohydrate, lower sugar intake. They're starting to read food labels for the first time in their life. Right. They look at what's actually in the food. I have a regular complaint, and that's the regular complaint I have is that a lot of my patients complain about their shoulders. Really? And it's because they're holding the labels up and looking at the stuff all the time. <laughs> that's great. And they, so they go to the shops and they're going around the supermarket and they're getting cramp in their shoulders from holding up the food labels. So yes. I only laugh at them and say, well, I'm only trying to drum up business then, you know. Oh, that's great. You you know, I, I use a, uh, a, a simple... Um, I try. Well, I'm trying to learn to use simpler uh, uh, descriptions and recommendations to people. So one of the ones I've I've enjoyed um, is telling people, well, if you if you can't understand the label, put it back on the shelf. It's quite simple. Uh, or the other is, if it's advertised on, uh, if it's heavily advertised, don't buy it because it's not right. going to be real food. I mean, when was the last time you saw a uh, you know a brand of broccoli? <laughs> Being that being advertised on primetime TV. <laughs> well, you don't, oh, the other one, as I say, don't eat by the numbers. If it's got numbers written on the label, then it's probably not good for you. Ah, that's a good one. Okay. 
ten percent less fat would be a typical. Uh, oh no, it, I'm talking about the additives. Oh, the you know, additives got, themselves. Oh the, yes, of course. So if the numbers, if you've got numbers written on the label, I don't know, I don't know what happens in Spain, but if you actually look at real food, which again local and seasonal, sure. it does, it doesn't have any labels on it. No, no, exactly. Same. At, same at the local food market, it doesn't have a label telling you all the ingredients that have been added to it. Right. Yeah, it's uh, you know what's interesting. Spain is the is an agricultural powerhouse. In fact, they're the number yes. one, the largest producer of organic food in in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, ninety uh, high ninety uh, something percent, all of this goes to northern is exported to northern Europe. So it's quite hard to find organic product in many even the even many uh, major cities in Spain. You have to look for it. Although it is getting a little better. Do, do you have farmers markets in Spain? Uh, you do in the rural areas, but it's it's not. You know what? It, you don't have it. The the same. For example, I was in Los Angeles uh, uh, a few months uh, back, and you would go out. You know, drive it out an hour, and you find this beautiful farmers market. Um, there, that concept is not yet common in Spain. Although you could find it in some village areas. That, that's taking off in Australia now, uh, farmers' markets. Um, yes. The farmers are bringing their produce into the cities, and that is, that's, uh, that's very heartening to hear that and see it in action. Oh, it is, yeah. The, yeah, the concept farm to table is, uh, is one that yes. uh, we – in fact, it's one that I use. I'm, doing a, I'm speaking tonight to a, to a group in an uh, organic store, and, um, in fact, we'll have a few Spanish doctors who are coming because they, they've heard that – that um, they, they, they call here in Spain they call the foreigners the giddy, giddy is the right. the nickname and so they they've heard that this giddy health guy is speaking and so so that's one of the terms I'm going to be introducing is farm to table but granja they say granja de a mesa so uh, it'll be uh, I'm just starting to speak publicly in Spanish so it's kind of a uh, a new situation right. so but it's a lot of fun. Well, anyway, Dr. Gary, this has been wonderful. I could go go on forever. I'm I'm um, I don't I've got time, but I know that uh, you've had a long day, and I want to respect your time and, and energy. And uh, I know you your wife is probably this is the end of your day, right? It is the end of the day. I've actually got to go back to work now and do some do some, but that's all right. That's that's my day job or yeah. evening job now. That's fantastic. Well, I look forward to to uh, you know to staying in touch with you, and uh, this is. Um, this has been fantastic. So thanks so much for your for your time and uh, your energy and everything you're doing. And uh, we're going to put this up on YouTube. Uh, we've got sort of a backlog right now of uh, of a number of videos, but this will go up in the next few weeks. I'll let you know, and and I'll be publicizing that on uh, through uh, through Twitter and our Facebook pages as well. Um, I, I put a note on your Facebook uh, your Facebook group page this morning just before the interviews. Uh, mm. That'll be it's on there Thank somewhere, you. and then this will also go on iTunes, uh, which is we're going to be starting the the show officially on iTunes uh, in late January. Once we have a okay. uh, uh, our, we have a plan to uh, to try to get on the the new and noteworthy list of uh, which gives you a lot of extra exposure, and so we're working with a, a business strategist who's giving us some tips on how that works because I have really no idea myself, but uh, we're trying to make this, get this thing sort of launched in a good, uh, good fashion. I, th this topic is, <clears throat> um, it, it's clearly taking off. Um, uh, Robert Lusty, who you probably, who, you know of oh, Robert yes, Lusty? I, well, I, I have <coughs> not interviewed him, but yeah, very aware of his work. Um, Robert and I were um, talking about that earlier this year in New Zealand, and we actually see that 2015 is the year that this will take off. Uh, you know, the whole concept, it's growing, but we actually see it will probably, we hope and somewhat, you know, pray to a degree that 2015 will see it exponentially grow. Yeah, that's, that's a, that would be wonderful. You know, the one heartening fact is uh, this, uh, in, just in recent, um, well, during, in this year, I did, a few months back, uh, Time Magazine in the States had a cover story mm. on this topic. Oh, on fat. That maybe, I don't yeah, know. Butter if, is fat. Yeah, and that's may probably, uh, certainly the, 
one of the top magazines in all of the U.S. So to get a cover story there is, uh, you know, entering popular culture in a, uh, as we talked about before, from a bottom, you know, as a bottoms up thing, because they've, they've uh, taken that. I was a bit surprised <laughs> to see it so soon, but uh, very happy to see it also. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I blogged that one uh, around the time. Right. Um, are you aware that there's a, a, a summit on this in South Africa in February? You know, I, I am. I am aware. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I'd love to, uh, I'm still negotiating with my wife <laughs> to, uh, yeah. to see if, if, uh, if we might uh, work that out. It's, um, but uh, are you going yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the speakers at it. So oh, Tim brilliant. Notes, I see you interviewed Tim recently, but Tim's asked me to come along and speak on inflammation and cancer. Yes, fantastic. Tim Noakes. Tim Noakes, yes. Tim Noakes. Actually, well, you know what? I shared a video that I just that I was on the, but it's, but I haven't, have not yet done an interview. We're looking forward to that, though, in the hmm. future. I shared a, a, an interview that someone else had done uh, because, hmm. uh, just because I, I really enjoyed his, his uh, form, you know, his, um, his communication style and uh, it's, oh, it's very dry. Well, I, I, I got a, a note, an email today saying he retired yesterday. Yeah, I saw on Facebook, actually, I shared a, uh, someone had shared a quote that he talked about, and I saw a retirement uh, speech, and I was, uh, mm. I didn't realize, you know, he, I didn't realize he was up for retirement, but uh, uh, he made a point that if, if, um, that was quite heartening, that I shared it with Vinny yesterday in our interview, and he said, uh, because Vinny was, Vinny is getting some, some heavy attacks right now from, certain people uh, as he's becoming more public and getting more and more national recognition. And I said, you know, Vinny, look at that as a, as that means you're getting, you're having success. And uh, I said, here's what Tim Noakes said. You know, if you're not, if you're not getting attacked, you're probably not working hard enough. That's right. There's a lot in that quote. I'm, I'm thinking about putting it into a quote maker tonight. Yeah, yeah. It, he said it more eloquently than I did. It was more than that, mm. but something along those lines. And so, uh, so yeah, that's, I would look, yeah, I would love, in fact, if you can suggest anyone for, for, um, the, if, for future interviews, that's actually our bottle, our, uh, our bottleneck right now is in, in organizing the interviews because, uh, that's, uh, you know, as it, as it gets bigger, as, you know, it, it becomes easier. So, you know, having, Every person helps, but anyone that you can suggest, uh, you know, if if that would be uh, if if that would be possible, I would much appreciate it. Well, there's a few guys here in Australia and New Zealand I can touch base with. So, oh yeah, that would be fantastic. And uh, well, and that's uh, that's pretty easy to to link them up to you. So I'll, I'll I'll email them and see if they're interested. Yeah, that would be fantastic and be fantastic. And this is going to help. You know, as how this the more as we get more of a uh, a mass of of people, especially you know authority figures and and uh, like yourself, that's going to help move, you know shift the the hearts and minds of the other you know of both the pu- general public and the other you know healthcare professionals who are out there. So, uh, so I don't see myself as an authority figure. I mean, I I'm just a guy banging on about what's right, and right. that's what it's. A- well, you you, you may not, but you but but by your position, you are. So I mean, it's uh, you know you. I can say that I can explain a lot of uh, not as well as you, but I can explain a lot of what you've explained. But just by your position, you're going to have a lot more impact, and uh, that's why I'm happy to promote. You know, my feeling is uh, instead of me banging on about it, I'd rather connect other you know people who are have have more authority than I. And promote, you know, promote us all because uh, my grandfather used to say, "A rising, a rising tide lifts all ships." And uh, that's correct. Yeah. You know, it's, and that, that, that's why that's why we're chatting now because I think it. Uh, there's a, a a professor from um, southern uh, Spain and Alfred uh, Furtado who actually translated my nutritional model of modern disease into Spanish. Oh, really? I, I did not know that. Alfred and wh- how was uh, the last her, name? Hurtado. Um, hang on, I can. Oh, okay, Hurtado. Okay, I've got it. That's with H H U R T A D O. Yeah, that would probably yeah. be it. Um, I 
You're still there? Yes, yes. I've just... Um, uh, lost it. I don't have his email with me, so... Yeah, that's okay. I think I can find it because Hurtado is a, is a fairly... It, uh, Spanish is very phonetic, so it's quite easy for me to spell the... I think I've got it, H-U-R-T-A-D-O. I'm pretty certain that's it. I, I can search it up, but if you go to my... Um, if you go to YouTube mm -hmm. and Gary Fetke, he, he's, actually, he's, he's actually done it. He's done the translation into Spanish. So Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely so. bilingual, so that'll be great. I'll, you know, I may share that at, tonight at my presentation. Um, in fact, I'm going to try to contact uh, – uh, and so Alf Alfredo Hurtado would be a professor, you believe? Or yeah, he's a professor of nutrition down in southern Spain. Hey, whereabouts are you? Uh, well, actually, I'm in the south today. Uh, my base is Madrid, but my wife uh, right. and her family are in the south, and so I'm, be, I'm, I'm on the uh, high speed train quite often, <laughs> going south. Okay. Yeah. If, if I, um, I will email you in his contact details in, in the next you know, five minutes or so. Oh, f brilliant! That would be yeah, his email. <coughs> That's brilliant. And, um, I'm just seeing if another computer is coming on here. Hang on. Um, uh, I've had a computer death this year. 